Paul Lomheim. We're going to discuss his lifelong career in music as well as your father's. So let's start with Sam. We'll go way back. Tell me, what do you know about Sam's beginnings in music? How and did he get started? First of all, he's got the right name for it. Sam, the yes. piano man, yeah. played against Sam. <laughs> but my dad, uh, what I'm told is that back in his high school, which was Central High in Moose Jaw, you know, he was uh, learned how to play piano, and um, he was really, my mom says that he was really into the boogie woogie. And when they had, uh, uh, what do you call it? When the students met, like just for a meeting or whatever, they would have to settle the students down there, call my dad to do one boogie woogie song. But yeah, my dad uh, was really into boogie woogie, I guess, and also jazz. And then later, my dad moved to Saskatoon, I believe it was around 1954. And um, he started playing some bands there. Um, he's, like I was born in '56, so I was before my time. No, a few years before my time. But my dad was telling me I oh, used to play in these big bands. And, oh, by the way, back in Mushaw too, he had his own bands. I've got photos of uh, uh, his big band. And he, yeah, he's a piano player in some big band and uh, things like that. He used to tell me how he used to play at the Desbo quite a bit. Then later on. Um, you know, he played at the Cork and Bottle and Martin Ball there, and he played in the Sheraton Lounge there. And, oh, and I remember when he used to play in the basement of the Red Lion on 20th Street, because I was 16 years old at that point, and for me to borrow the car, I'd have to drive him to the Red Lion and then pick him up at 1.30 in the morning. So, yeah, it was, um, I was, um, I thought I was lucky to be raised by such, uh, Cool guy, like you know, great piano player. When he was doing his single act, was he doing instrumentals? Or did oh, he no, he well? sang too. You know, I actually liked his voice. You know, um, one year um, uh, after I moved to Prince Albert here, I asked him to come up and I recorded him. Um, we had a little studio at Gordon Grants. So for Christmas, I gave my brothers and sisters, back then it was a cassette. So one side was me playing. Um, guitar instrumentals and my dad did all instrumentals except for one song he ended with a Christmas song a medley of two songs but um, so I have that on CD that was kind of cool so um, yeah he um, there were some gigs that would be all instrumental and some would be no like let's say the Port and Bottle his big thing was um, he had a song sheets with like a hundred songs or so and people just yell out number 82 and he'd play it so he was good at that you know and he always did a good job of kind of keeping up with the, the hits. So oh, yeah. He didn't you know, get old I remember, fashioned. I remember my dad, and this is not a word of a lie, my dad learned Bohemian Rhapsody. And my dad would have a cassette deck, and he'd start and he'd just write stuff down, you know. And um, my dad seldom bought sheet music, like very, very seldom. He would, um, like my friends thought that was so cool that your dad is plays William Rhapsody, and you know, like so he was, uh, he wasn't popular music, you know. And I also remember, since I'm a little bit older, is he let me stay up uh, to watch TV the first time the Beatles played, and I, that's that was the turning point for me. I didn't want to be a piano player. I, uh, I then actually I wanted Paul McCartney. I guess was my hero, so I wanted to get a bass, and I wanted to get the Beatle bass to Hoffman, but I got one. Hopper look alike and later I went for bass over to the guitar. But but yeah, because my dad um, my dad taught me so much about theory also, you know. He did try give me a he did uh, give me a few piano lessons and um, I kept leaning over towards the guitar. Yeah. Do you remember when he started to teach lessons and when he came up with his whole yeah, when, writing of his he, own arrangement? He taught in the basement of our house in Avalon, in Dufferin Avenue, and I can't remember, like, I must have been really young, because, um, like, he, he had a waiting room, and then he had the room, waiting room for the students, and then he had his studio, but I remember when he had the door closed teaching, we used to, we used to have a candy bowl there, and I remember he would have pajamas on Saturday morning, and I would sleep in since I was a kid, and uh, on the Saturday, and those little candies from there, so, uh, he started when I was very young. I can't remember. Him. I think I was like maybe grade one, when he, as far as I know. And he taught. I couldn't believe how many students he had a week. Like he was uh, something like eighty to hundred. 
And the other thing that used to be a tradition with our family is he would write a Christmas song and he kind of, you know, wrote it uh, on music like, and um, on Christmas Eve, we used to go in his station wagon and go, and this is on Christmas Eve, and we'd go to every student's house and drop a little uh, Christmas card and song, and that song in the mailbox. And it was just a tradition because when we got home, uh, my mom had hot chocolate for us, and it was just, it, it was, when you got older, you kind of, when we got older, let's say, that, or later we thought, man, that was fun when we were kids. Uh, like, you'd take just the older kids, like I'm the second oldest in the family. And my sister, that's two years older than me, she uh, is, no, she's a professional uh, piano player. She's, years ago, um, she was the, played a band, Western Tour, the opening act for B.J. Thomas. So uh, she plays piano quite well. Your dad was also involved in radio? Yeah, back in the 60s. Um, him and uh, Jack McClung, they had a show called Two for the Show. And I'm, I'm not sure how many years they went on, but I believe it was something like five or six years. And it was uh, from, I believe, 8.30 to 9.30. It was, it was kind of a comedy show, but my dad would get up at 4.30 in the morning and listen, re or listen to the news. And on the Two for Show, we always sang um, a song, he sang a song about the uh, news happening that day. And he had a knack for, uh, if there was something that was bad, I don't know how he did it, but he uh, somehow still could sing that when it was something a little bit, like not that great. And um, years ago, when, when my, my dad passed away 11 years ago, but when my dad turned 65 as a gift for him, I, just for the heck of it, I phoned Saskatchewan Archives in Regina and asked them if there's any chance they would have a copy or two, two for the show. And they had um, three or four. So uh, I think when he was 65, there was still, it was still cassette back then too. So I gave it to him for just his birthday. And when he turned 65, he said, who are these guys? And he thought they were funny. I said, it's you, Dad. But, uh, but yeah, Jack McClung, when he left the radio, my dad um, didn't, they wanted my dad to continue, and my dad could not do it. It was kind of, kind of like Wayne and Schuster back in the 60s. Like, they, my dad um, had a lot of respect for Jack McClung, and uh, so my dad left the radio business back then. But I remember my dad would be teaching uh, also, like at night or during the day and night. So we would go to CKOM back then. It was in the executive building um, on 20th Street and having a sea or someplace like that. It's uh, it's where the light, lighthouse is now. Yeah. Yeah. So we'd go there. Avenue. We'd go there, and my dad, uh, my dad had a reel to reel, so he would record all these songs. And I remember when I was a little kid or young, that I was telling my dad, I said, "You got to learn this song because I'd look at the like." Uh, hits and uh, my dad said what song is that and I said light my fire and keep in mind I was really young so my dad said is it by and I said Joe Spelican I guess I didn't it was Jose Feliciano but it was a running joke with my dad and I for quite a while but I said Joe Spelican but yeah my dad would uh, record these things on the reel to reel and then he would go home and learn the songs and chart them out and uh, give them to the students and yeah and by the way one of the students, uh, which my dad had a lot of respect for as a, as a person and a musician, was Gil Campbell. And my dad was one, or when Gil was taking lessons from my dad, I think it was 1967, Gil was saying that to my dad, he's in a band, but they don't have a bass player. So my dad called me down and says, come downstairs, he introduced me to Gil Campbell. Well, I ended up joining the band. That was my first band. For, it was called For Whom the Bell Tolls. And Gil and I became best friends after that, and we played in bands for many years. So, yeah, so my dad made the connection between Gil and I. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So I also personally took lessons from Sam in 1984. Yes. I was 13, and I used to go to the house in the basement that you mentioned. Yeah. And he had an interesting routine. He had a notebook that he would write out what songs he wanted me to learn each week. Right. And usually, and I don't know if this is normal, because of course it's based on every student's different, but 
he would usually give me three or four of his handwritten songs yes. every week, and then I'd go home and practice and practice and practice. And he, his main focus was writing melodies for the right hand with just chords, and yeah. then you'd have to come up with a left right. hand. And sometimes he had left hand ideas, so he Latin bass yeah, things that, he wanted that, going, or, or the movie movie thing. Yeah. yeah. So that was kind of, and that helped influence my playing a lot too. So right. uh, it's interesting because me and Gil are in many ways very similar in what we do, but um, different generations. But right. uh, um, it's interesting though that I didn't stay with Sam that long. My, right. my grandmother would decide to be my teacher's first, so every year oh, right, I tried yeah. a new teacher. Uh, but yeah, so that was a lot of fun. I was in grade eight at that time. Yeah. So, and I still have all those songs. So yeah. in, in a short period of time, I think he gave me about 60. Yeah. But I know it, he had those drawers in his basement full of yeah. photocopies had, uh, and he had thousands yeah. of pages. After my dad passed away, um, my mom gave me a big chunk of his music. So, and uh, we also, the Gil Campbell uh, played at my dad's funeral. So. He's got a few of the books, but it's just cool seeing his handwriting. And yeah. it was very good. I, he used to use that fountain pen too right. when he wrote music. Yeah. yeah, and he when he took students, you know, he had um, prerequisite that you had to have several years. I don't ever remember him ever teaching anyone right from scratch, except for myself. And that's probably true because his stuff was just advanced enough that yeah, a beginner. Yeah, I did. Uh, my dad. He did tell me that when he was young in Musha, he did take Royal, Royal Conservatory, but he wanted to go in a little bit different direction. Yeah. yeah. So once he was done radio, then did teaching become his full-time Teaching, and I would say also he was a professional student. My dad would go to university once, and I asked my dad, like, what, what do you want to do? And he, he said it's not for any job. He just wanted, he, it was, and like, he took everything, like, you know, uh, same as my mom. Um, he just wanted to learn more and more, you know. And yeah, so he went to the University of Lots and, um, yeah, he got, a, I he got his degree in English, and uh, yeah, he took sociology and medicine. By the way, my dad originally wanted to be a doctor, and I said, well, why didn't you? You could have been rich. And he, but he said, I'm not just kidding, but he, uh, he said he started having too many kids, he couldn't afford it. But yeah, my dad was um, in university for several years full time because he wanted to be, get into medicine. But uh, um, we, I have four brothers and three sisters, so there's eight of us. So uh, that kind of put a stop to that. Was your mother involved with music at all? My mother, years ago, knew how to play the piano. And that, I'm talking years ago, like I think the last time I heard her I think I heard her play maybe once or twice when I was like eight years old. But yeah, my mom um, doesn't play at all. But, yeah, but she's also a perfect professional student too, yeah. Did you have any grandparents that were musical? My grandfather, which is my dad's dad, he played accordion. And uh, he's from Norway. And uh, I used to enjoy his accordion playing. Uh, he used to play a song called Life in the Finland Woods or Mockingbird Hill, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and I, I loved how he played that, and I, I learned how to play it, and we ended up playing together. But yeah, he just played accordion, and that was it. So is that where you think Sam got his initial music interest? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, so, um, yeah, my dad owned accordion for a while, but I think um, he, he did not play very often, you know. But his main, main thing was the piano. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about your sister. So she's the oldest, so she's took piano lessons. Yeah, she took lessons from my dad. And uh, she played in some rock bands. She played Buds on Broadway. Or with the, I forget what they were called, but my sister's the oldest in the family. And as I said, there's eight kids in her family. And she played, but the youngest in the family. He was a guitar player. And somehow I didn't make the cut in the band, I guess. But yeah, so uh, they played, uh, I believe there's three girls and two guys, but they played really cool songs like Jimi Hendrix and Joe Cocker and Cream. Yeah, but they had some, they had a cool repertoire. Then my sister asked me once, she goes, how come you don't hire me? Because I book all the acts in the Orleans Casino. I said, you guys are too loud. <laughs> but uh, but I, that, that's probably 15 years ago or so. 
Um, but I go see them. But yeah, she doesn't play anymore. I mean, she just plays for herself. She lives in Toronto now. And then how did you get started? You said you heard the Beatles on TV. Yeah. You were eight years old. And then besides that, I think the turning point also besides guitar is back in elementary school, we had to pick up an instrument and my dad suggested the tuba. Since I was a bass player, I guess. So I learned, uh, I took the tuba up and then I was in, later I was in Holy Cross Band and then I joined Lions Band the Junior Symphony, Saskatoon Concert Band, and um, also I started in like the Saskatoon Concert Band besides too, but I played the upright bass too. So um, that has really, you know, I was thinking about it a few years ago, I think that really helped me with my guitar playing, because I'm a solo guitar player. Um, I play the chords and things, or melody at the same time. And when I'm playing, let's say, um, some tune that I'll play just in the bottom, First three frets or whatever, and then I'll play up high. Is in my mind, I think about those are the trumpets, and then now I'm going to do the clarinet and flute part. And I almost feel like being in those bands, like Connor Sasson, Cross Grand, Holy Cross, Lions Band, um, that's helped me with my guitar playing, you know, because um, I do think about that when I play. I I just don't want to just keep playing um, everything just in the one area there. I think, why not? You know, let's do a variation of that song. So you mentioned your first band, For Whom the Bell Tolls. What yeah. year would that have been? Um, I would say 68. Um, I remember Gil Candles, one year older than me, and um, I forget if he was in grade seven or eight, or, or I meant, sorry, if I was in seven, he was in eight. But anyways, we played for New Tana High School graduation, and it was at three in the morning on two lanes of rack bowling, yeah. which was downtown. And I remember that because of Gil and I being so young, that Gil's dad and my dad were our chaperones to be there because there was, I believe there was some alcohol being involved there. But we played at three in the morning. Um, yeah, I'm like, I enjoyed, uh, that was, we, our band played for a while and later I started playing with other bands, um, played, played with a band called Sunset Boulevard, which that band, we used to play a lot of university dances in the basement of Centennial or now uh, yeah. TCU. Who is in that group? Um, Dan Jean, singer. Daryl Worst was a drummer, I'm trying to think. Uh, Tom Fitzgerald, guitar player. Um, yeah, it was a good group and uh, yeah, we played lots of dances. And when I played with, um, also I played with, um, the, the Martin brothers, who then actually before they were with Gene Cook and then Gil Campbell again. We ended up playing, a, we played lots. Uh, we also played a lot of university dances and we played just around the province, you know. I remember um, after I left the band, I kind of helped them. I was their tour manager, which I didn't have a clue what I was doing, but being, um, I, I started getting to production and things like that, but I um, remember being with them when they opened for Steppenwolf in Saskatoon and in China, you know. But yeah, so, so I mentioned that, you know, I've been playing guitar and bass for years, but I slowly started drifting off in production of organizing uh, concerts or shows or like country music awards or Saskatchewan summer games, so that is my I think my main thing now, you know, yeah. still play guitar once in a while. I mean, professionally, not very often. So all those years through the 60s, 70s, were you always sort of a rock guy, pop party yeah. guy? I was never country until I moved to Prince Albert. And that, by the way, moving to Prince Albert was, uh, like, I love Saskatoon, but I love Prince Albert too, because when I moved to Prince Albert, you know, I wasn't sure what kind of caliber of musicians you'd see here. Within a week, I'm calling back to Saskatoon. I'm saying, holy smokes. You know? I think one of the first guys I met was Freddie Pelshay, just a smoking guitar player. And then Dennis Adams, Rod Jansen, it just keeps going on and on. And there's like very good players here. So I joined the band with Freddie Pelshay. Back then, we are called Northwest Rebellion Band. We had Donnie Pronto. And then we had Donnie Pronto as a fiddle player, George Piston. We had Dave Tupper, passed away. Um, Dave Tupper, uh, late Dave Tupper, drummer. But yeah, we um, 
we were, that's when I started playing country. I said to my friends, when, when you move to Prince Albert, if you don't play country, you play western, you know, uh, country and western. But yeah, so that's when I started getting into the country thing. But before that, all Saskatoon was always rock. How did you land up coming to PA? Well, it's funny that um, my girlfriend back then, we had split up and was kind of single back then. And, I went to a show called the NAM Show in Los Angeles, which is the National, National Association of Music and Merchandisers. So what that is, it's around 35,000 people attend this, and it's people from music stores in North America. And anyways, um, I was working for Gordy Brands in Saskatoon, and I ran, I knew the guys from Gordy Brands and Prince Albert. And we went for dinner one night and had some drinks and they said, you should come up to Prince Albert works for us. And I thought to myself, well, there's nothing right now holding me back. And um, Prince Albert Great Grants used to kick our butt all the time. Uh, like they were doing quite well. And um, they had a like, really good story. So I thought, what the heck, I think I'll go up for a year or so. And that was 32 years later, I mean 32 years ago. And yeah, so I worked for Great Grants and, for quite a while there. Very cool. Tell me about your other siblings that were musical. Um, as I said, I got four brothers, three sisters. Three of my four brothers are guitar players and bass players, I guess. Um, my one brother, two years younger than me, Andy, that was in Vancouver, he just decided it wasn't his cup of tea, so he never did play. And then all my sisters, like, as I said, Christine, a piano player. And then one of my other sisters, you know, she played clarinet like in elementary school, I'm not even sure, high school. So there's only, there's my one sister, Christina, that plays piano, myself and three other brothers. So that's about it. So we got, I think, three that don't play. Yeah. But they enjoy listening to us, you know. Um, I really enjoy playing with my brothers, like, you know, Christmas time. Uh, my brother Tom would ask, or Pat or Mark, whatever, he would ask me to play um, whatever song, um, and then we would incorporate a second uh, harmony or whatever. And, and they, like my main thing is acoustic, it, like it is, like I don't play electric at all, except for bass. And my other brothers, uh, they play electric very well, and uh, they do play acoustic too, but they're more electric, I'm more acoustic. So, We'd grab a couple of acoustics and learn different parts of uh, different songs and play together. And then, unfortunately, because of us being all over the map, it'd be at Christmas time. And what I mean is, I got a brother in Vancouver, sister in Calgary, sister in Toronto. You know, yeah. Back in the '70s, when you were playing guitar in the bands, were you playing acoustic then? No, I was playing bass. Okay. Yeah, I was a bass player. And um, oh, and then. You know, I mentioned that I was playing rock bands all the time. I played lots of jazz gigs. I was uh, Sheldon Corbett, and I used to play a place called Lucci's. And we were the kind of house band there. It was the second floor, um, I think it was Second Avenue. Um, what was that group called? We didn't have a name, I don't think. Yeah, we were just a uh, house band. Um, oh, I'm trying to think of some of the other guys. I just watched one of your interviews on uh, guitar player uh, but anyways, um, yeah, it was jazz stuff. Oh, Keith Bartlett? Yeah, Keith Bartlett. I played with him for quite a while, or quite a few gigs. But we, we, like, we were with a host band, and they would feature somebody, let's say from Regina, that's a jazz piano player, or someone that's a sax player, or whatever, you know? And you know, one of the, I was honored that one, I played with jazz, uh, basically once with uh, Gordy Brandt. And that was a real challenge. Like that was so cool. Um, Gordy was just monster on guitar. So I jazz. You know, I was playing rock bands, but then I started getting into the jazz thing. I was, like my main thing with jazz is uh, I love swing. But then besides swing, I just just like jazz stuff. You know, if anyone knows what the fake book is, I play all the songs from the fake book. I'm not sure why they call it the fake book, but but it has a lot of cool songs in it. Did you find through the 70s that you were riding the wave of the popularity of nightclubs and based on how that was going shaped what you landed up playing? In yeah. the sense that a lot of other guys in Saskatoon also shifted to jazz as maybe the the top 40 scene they felt was dying. I was, um, 
when I think about it, I started playing, I think I started playing jazz, to, like as I got older, like after high school, I kind of started getting out of the rock thing. Yeah, after high school, I totally got into the jazz thing after high school when I think about it now. I, um, yeah, it was mainly rock. Um, I played some, I uh, sure, I meant to say jazz. Yeah, so jazz was my thing until I moved here, but still played a couple of rock bands. Yeah. So what band would you say you were in the longest? Um, I think they're all, none of them were that long, they were like three years. Northwest Rebellion, the one with Freddie Kelsey, uh, was quite long, or not long. And also uh, Sunset Boulevard, the one with uh, Dan Jean, Tom Fitzgerald, Harold the Worst. I apologize if I forget, forgot any other names. Yeah. Have any promo photos or anything from any of these bands? I go one, and I'm on a horse. That's North Carolina's <laughs> Rebellion. Okay. And people laugh when they see that one. I also, that's the only one I have, and I have a mullet with a cowboy hat. Yeah, but um, I wish I could get a video of some of our bands, you know. And, um, but because we played, like as I said, university dance, uh, you know, we played bands that played uh, weddings, you know. I forgot to mention one band, I forgot what we were called, but I did play in a Ukrainian polka band once, and German type of band. We had a accordion player, a violin player, a fiddle player, which um, Tom John Krasinski. Um, so we used to play the Concordia Club, play a lot of weddings. So I did that for a while, and I didn't mind that, you know, even though it was all one in five bass playing, just boom, boom, boom. It was the, you know, it wasn't the jazz type of thing. Right, right. Do you uh, have any favorite nightclubs in Saskatoon that you enjoyed playing? Yeah, with us. We actually didn't play many nightclubs. We didn't really play at nightclubs at all. It was all university dances and um, we played, you know, back then, I don't know what, like we used to play band sport quite a bit, but back then band sport was just a half bar. Yeah. And another place was the Bell Vista in Humboldt. We couldn't wait to play there because it was crazy, like uh, how busy it was. And um, again, as I mentioned, the university dances were just a blast because there's so many people, you know, and uh, it was just so much fun. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we kind of, we were not a really a nightclub band. We were just, we were like one-nighters. I think the one-nighters sometimes is a good way to go because sometimes it pays better than the clubs. How did your connection with the casino start? Then, after I moved to Prince Albert, I volunteered for lots of stuff. Like um, I produced the Saskatchewan Summer Games opening ceremonies, the Western Canada Summer Games opening ceremonies. I was involved with the Canadian Special Olympics opening ceremonies. Um, did shows like Produce the Country North Show, which is part of the Winter Festival, which is a fairly big show. And I had done so much stuff as volunteer that I was learning how to do all this stuff. And Finally, I saw this job posted, entertainment manager, and, and I thought, you know, I, maybe I can give it a shot since I've got this background experience, which I've never been paid for. Or, I mean, it was a lot of volunteering. And um, plus, I was playing bands and professional musicians. I knew a lot of musicians, and I thought, you know, I, I probably know how to contact them. So I had my interview, and it was a three month probation, and I made it through my three month probation. and. That's um, November, it'll be 21 years that I've been doing it. Uh, yeah, so um, I've enjoyed it because um, I've met so many good musicians and I've booked everything from country to tribute bands to you name it. Uh, even booked some celebrities too. We, um, we have some private events that I've booked uh, Norm from Cheers or uh, from The Love Boat, uh, Gopher and Isaac. Yeah, also uh, Freeze Gummy, Larry Channon, and Terry the Nurse, Father Mulcahy from Ash. Mm. Uh, he passed away, and Freddie Fender. So it was, uh, I've enjoyed my coming up 21 years here because uh, <coughs> it's been a blast meeting all these people and, you know, hearing some so, pretty good players. And the casino opened here in 98? Uh, 96, 96, I believe. 
and they had the, the big stage on the big yeah. floor back then. Yeah. Sorry, the casino, first of all, had opened at a different location while they're building this one. So the stage, not 90, sorry, uh, yeah, sorry, that would be uh, 98. So um, in 98 is when they got their stage. That was March of 1998. I started in November of 98. And um, that was a learning experience. When you're, like, I mean, I'm dealing with provincial, or Saskatchewan bands and Manitoba and Alberta bands. Now I'm dealing with working on getting people over the border, uh, Revenue Canada, all that. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, we had that stage for a few years, like probably eight years or so, till we, uh, we were offered to have more slot machines and we moved the stage and what pays more. So, um, yeah, it was cool, like uh, Freddie Bender, Terry Clark, Loretta Lynn, Ricky Skaggs, Randy Bachman, you know, so um, it was, that was a cool learning experience because there is quite a bit when you're looking at out of the U.S., you know, when you have to get them the green card and the Revenue Canada thing and book the, you know, booking flights uh, was quite something, yeah. At that time, I was performing with Marilyn Faye Parney, oh, yeah. and I remember New Year's Eve '98. Charlie Major played a set on the stage. And yeah. Then me and Marilyn played a set up here, and then he played another set. Yeah. So I presume you booked that one. I that did. Probably, right? Yeah. That's how Charlie and I became friends, and we're actually. That's another thing is that um, some of these people I've become very good friends, like Charlie and I have been friends ever since then. And we've gone golfing at Elk Ridge at Mark's and Mark's Nine Golf Course, and Charlie and I, you know, when Charlie turned, um, I forget what year or it doesn't matter what age he was, but his birthday is on New Year's Eve. So um, actually, he was turning 60, that's what it was. So I booked him here on New Year's Eve. I asked him, because we were golfing that summer at Elk Ridge, and I, and I knew his birthday was on New Year's Eve. I said, How old are you? 60. I said, Where are you? Where are you playing? He goes, I don't have a gig yet. I said, can I hire you? And he, he says, oh yeah, sure. So I was serious, so I hired him. So we had a happy New Year's and birthday party at the same time. You know, another one is that I became friends with is Russell DeCarl from Prairie Oyster. He's, um, we call each other once in a while and just a wonderful person, you know. Yeah, there's been a few. I used to get Christmas cards from the Bellamy Brothers and Freddie Fender. Yeah. Very cool. You've also been, uh, I believe, all of the SCMA. Yeah, this is got some country music as awards. awards. Yeah, um, I believe I produced the last 12 years. This last one was just in Saskatoon. The year before was in Prince Albert. Next year is in Regina. So um, that is quite something. This year was probably the toughest one I did. Um, I do enjoy doing it because it keeps me busy during the winter right. for a while there. But to have 19 different performers in one show, that I'm, in the past has always been the governor 12. But having 19, you know, it's fine and dandy having, fine and dandy having 19. But when you have to do 19 sound checks and you have a very limited window, or a window of so many hours, somehow we ended up 10 minutes early. So um, thank God with Hal Shrank from Saskatoon being the house band leader and. We just told every performer, it's one after another, like it's not a rehearsal, it's a sound check, you do it once and we'll go on to the next person. So I do enjoy producing the Country Music Awards because you work so hard at putting that show together, it's only like a two hour show, that's all over with. And as, as I mentioned, you only have one sound check. So it's not like, it's not like uh, Country North Show that we have four weeks of rehearsals or five weeks of rehearsals. This is, you know, first time the presenters have gone up, first time the MC's gone up, so you're just hoping. But, it's, you know, a friend of mine told me years ago, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And if that link breaks, then we're kind of buggered up. But what I like about country music is that our voice is that people like Hell Shrink, for example, and um, Graham Condo that does the TV production, um, everyone puts their extra two cents worth in, and we all, it comes out good, you know, it's just nice. Yeah. What do you feel has been the most challenging thing you've ever done? Oh, I think that last country is going to make you next. Um, I'm not sure. Um, there's, when I put on um, some of the shows outside, like 
of the, like I get hired on the side to put on shows from Ron Sakamoto out of Alberta. Ron Sakamoto is my number one idol when it comes to music production, and I've learned so much from Ron. But when I did, um, I've done like Tom Cochran, New Greedy Irvine, the way you open, but when I did Johnny Reed, that was quite something because what they wanted was the biggest stage they could possibly get that would go in that building before the fire department says something. So we um, we had a meeting with the fire department and we had a 70 some foot stage, I believe it is. And you know, the, the opening after Johnny Reed was a, a husband and wife, right? But when I had to book the hotel rooms, in total it was 41 people, which uh, when you're talking to Sammy and a couple buses and you know, that that was, uh, that went very well. You know, um, you just have a good crew, you know, and uh, it's just interesting when you have to hire riggers out of Saskatoon and the stage is coming, like Prince Elvis, uh, you know, it's a smaller city, so we can't get a stage like that. So, you know, you get Warren Dog and different companies involved. And yeah, so uh, Johnny Reed was a good one. I've done two Johnny Reed shows actually, so. What's in your future plans? I hope not to be put out to pasture yet. Um, I don't plan on retiring yet. I am 63 years old, but um, it's not quite ready for it. Uh, I think I might be bored. But I'd like to still put on some shows. I'm hoping, like with um, the Sakamoto, whenever he has a show that's a little smaller show that seats 3,500, then he'll he, he put some shows on in here. And uh, um, I'd like to still produce some shows wherever they can, and then still play some guitar, you know? Yeah, so that's about it, I think. You have ch any children? No, I don't. Yeah, my, and I'm married. My, I see my wife. We've been together this September 32 years, so, yeah. What do you think you have learned from your father? You know, being a musician or just... You know, uh, there's other things besides music with my dad. My dad, uh, I remember years ago, I came home and I said, I hate Gary, one of my friends, like I was like nine years old. And my dad told me that hate was too strong of a word. And I've learned stuff like that from my dad. Uh, like, you know, they said at my dad's eulogy, my nephew and niece did the eulogy. And they said, oh, we heard that, like my sister, which is her mom, or my nephew's mom, he said that when they were growing up, my sister was growing up, that we found a bug in the house, my dad would say, take it outside. And we'd say to my dad, how do we kill it? My dad would say, well, it, it has a family too. But my dad was, uh, my dad, um, I learned lots from a few people, like, you know, like, uh, as he said, you know, he said, he's the song of a word, and he was very kind, so I think I'm, I'm not that good. Yeah, you know, uh, he's just uh, a nice person. Excellent. I think about him every day, by the way. Excellent. Well, I've enjoyed our talk here. I've learned a lot, and congrats on everything you've achieved. Oh, no, thank you. I enjoyed this. It's always a pleasure to see you. Okay, yeah, you too. Thanks, Thanks very, very much, much. Terry.